So our development of spinners and spinner technology continues. Uh, today I'd like to talk about Majorana spinners. So this is a way of placing a reality condition on, uh, on spinner fields. This is very similar, at least in spirit, to uh, the difference between real and complex scalar fields uh, that you're hopefully familiar with from uh, quantum field theory. So let's get started. So the Majorana condition, as I was just saying, is a reality condition on spinners. So let's start and, and, and be naive, and we'll see that uh, our, our initial take on how to impose a reality condition is, is, uh, is not really general enough. So you might think if you have a spinner zeta, and I take the complex conjugate of it, the reality condition might just be to say that the complex conjugate of that spinner is, is the spinner itself. It's a very reasonable uh, way to start. But remember, I, I was telling you that we have this uh, fact that we, we have this fact that we can we can generate new representations of the Clifford algebra through unitary transformations. So I'm allowed to have some unitary matrix, and I can act with it on my spinner. So let's see how this affects my reality condition. So if I now take the complex conjugate of u times zeta and expand that out, I can write that, of course, as u star uh, zeta star. And by my reality condition, that ought to be u star zeta. And now I can insert one in a funny way. I can write this as u star u inverse u zeta. And now I see something funny. So here's my new spinner, and I take a complex conjugate of it, and it's related to the original spinner through this funny matrix. I used to have just a factor of one here, but after my unitary transformation, I now have this, this weird u star u inverse uh, matrix involved in my reality condition. So the lesson, and there's a lesson here, is that we should allow for a more general reality condition. When we take the complex conjugate of a spinner, we ought to allow that at some matrix times the original spinner, not just the original spinner. We ought to allow for this extra, this extra matrix uh, degree of freedom. Okay, so with this is our definition of a reality condition or a Majorana condition. Let's now search for some consistency conditions on, on this matrix B and, and on what's, in, what's, in, what's entailed in imposing such a, uh, such a reality condition. Well, one thing you could worry about is what happens when you take the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate? You should get maybe the same thing back again, right? So let's, let's see how that works. So if I have zeta, I know this is B zeta star, which is the same as B star zeta star, uh, but from here, I see I can write that now out as B star B zeta. Okay, so here's another funny thing that has to be true if I'm gonna impose such a reality condition. Uh, that product of B star and B had better be the identity. Okay, so that's, that's one consistency condition, and it's gonna be an important one. Uh, so let's give this equation a label. Let's call it the boat equation. So that's consistency condition number one. And now let's go on. Another thing I need is I need compatibility with the Lorentz algebra. And what does that mean? It means if I take a complex conjugate of a Lorentz transformation on my spinner, that had better be the same as B acting on the Lorentz transformation of my spinner. Right, that's that's the compatibility condition with the Lorentz algebra. So this is this this delta here is meant to be the action of the Lorentz group, and we saw what that was in in the first week of our, our class. We saw that we could write that transformation out as minus i over two omega mu nu our Lorentz generator zeta. And so when I've written this out, I've already taken into account a minus i. I I've, I've changed i with minus i by taking a complex conjugate. And I've also uh, assumed that that omega mu nu is real because it describes some boost or rotation. And on the other side, I have i over two omega mu nu pulling that through the b since those are just numbers. They commute with the b matrix m mu nu zeta. Okay, well, I can, I can cancel out the omega mu nu's and the i over two's or, or said another way, it's true for every generator, every little transformation I take. So it must be true for each generator individually. So I can write this condition as m mu nu zeta star is equal to minus b m mu nu zeta. Okay, so I, I've run out of room here. Let's copy this and move to the next page. Well, we can distribute the complex conjugation, write that as m mu nu star zeta star is equal to minus b m mu nu zeta. And then we'll use our, our, uh, our Majorana condition on the complex complexified spinner. We'll write that as m mu nu star 
b zeta is equal to minus b mu nu zeta. And now this has to be true for every spinner. So it has to be true on the operators which act on those spinners. So it's true for all zeta. I've got a complete basis. And so from this, I can see that uh, I must have that m mu nu star b is equal to minus b m mu nu. And this is going to be our second uh, consistency condition. Let's just rewrite it in a slightly different way. We can rewrite it moving the b to the other side. We can rewrite it as m mu nu is equal to minus b inverse m mu nu star b. And we'll call this our smiley face equation. And I'll just remark at the end, remember the, the mu nu's are quadratic in the gamma matrices in this, in this representation. And, and so therefore, uh, this condition on the mu nu's implies a, sim, uh, a related condition on the gamma matrices themselves, but it's a little bit more flexible. I'm allowed an extra sign in here that b gamma mu uh, b inverse is equal to plus or minus uh, gamma mu star. Because when I multiply two of those gamma matrices together, if I've got a minus sign, that minus sign just disappears. All right. And now it's kind of a funny thing that uh, it's actually not possible to realize both of these consistency conditions in every dimension. The sailboat equation and the smiley face equation. Now, for example, in d equals 5, uh, it turns out there are no Majorana fermions or no Majorana spinners. Okay, so that's a lot of technical buildup to introduce what this, this Majorana condition is. And now let's try to use it in some specific low dimensional examples to give you a little bit of a better feel of, of what's going on here. We'll start out very simple. Um, we're going to focus on d equals 2, 3, and 4, and we'll start with d equals 2. So in d equals 2, as we saw uh, a couple lectures ago, we could choose a representation where um, uh, gamma 0 is i sigma 2 and gamma 1 is equal to sigma 1. And I'll, I'll just point out that in this basis, the gamma matrices are manifestly real. I take a complex conjugate of them, I just get the same gamma, gamma matrices back. And because of that, it's possible to take this B matrix to be the identity matrix. And in this case, my uh, consistency conditions, the sailboat and the smiley face are are basically trivially satisfied. Well, B, B star is clearly one, and you know, I multiply or I conjugate a gamma matrix, gamma matrix by, by one, I get the gamma matrix back. I take the complex conjugate of it, I get the gamma matrix back. So, so both of these uh, con consistency conditions are, are, are trivial if you can write uh, the gamma matrices in a purely real uh, way. So I'm gonna make another comment here. We'll keep going and, and analyze this, this D equals two case a little bit further. So remarkably, uh, gamma, the gamma five matrix, which is just the product of gamma zero and gamma one, I can write this, this is the sigma three uh, Pauli matrix. It's diagonal in this basis. It's diagonal as basis. So that the B and the gamma five matrix commute, it turns out I can have uh, spinners that are simultaneously vile and Majorana. Let's, let's write a little table. So I've got my original Dirac representation, which was two complex dimensional or, or four real dimensional. I can decompose it one way into vial representations using the gamma five matrix, which is just this Pauli sigma three matrix. These are one complex dimensional representations. Or I can use my reality condition and decompose it into a Majorana spinner. So this is two real dimensional. Or I can actually impose both because uh, the gamma five matrix is diagonal in this in this uh, in this uh, really real representation, and this is representation where b is trivial. And so I'm allowed to have uh, spinners which are simultaneously Majorana and vile, and these are one real dimensional. And so this this last thing, this is rather special to two and also ten dimensions. It requires gamma to be diagonal in the Majorana basis. So the fact that you can have these, these representations which are simultaneously Majorana and Vial, I'll just remark in passing that this is a, quite an important fact in string theory, or, or, or more specifically, super string theory, where you can have these uh, representations which are simultaneously uh, Vial and Majorana for two dimensions, which is relevant for the string world sheet, and also in 10 dimensions, uh, which is the target space uh, for, for superstring theories. Okay, so I just mentioned that in passing. So let's keep going. That's two dimensions. 
Let's talk about D equals three. So we mentioned if we have this gamma five matrix, we can use that as the, the next gamma matrix in one dimension up. So that's what we'll do. We have gamma zero, which is still I sigma two. We have gamma one, which is still sigma one. And we saw that the gamma five matrix here was sigma three. And I'll, I'll again point out that these are all manifestly real. Uh, and so I can let uh, this B matrix again be the identity and I have uh, the possibility of imposing a Majorana condition on, on my three-dimensional uh, spinners. But also, as we saw in odd dimensions, there are no file representations because, well, we've used up our gamma-5 matrix. We have no now extra gamma matrix to play around with. Okay, so that's the story in D equals 3. You can have, you know, a, a two-dimensional complex representation, direct representation, or you can impose a Majorana condition on it and get a two-real dimensional Majorana uh, representation. And so the last case I'd like to discuss in this lecture is D equals 4. So we wrote down this uh, gamma matrix, uh, these gamma matrices in this nice basis a few lectures ago. We said we could use 0, this slight generalization of the Pauli uh, matrices, these sigma u's, sigma mu's, sorry, where sigma mu, well, the time-like bit was minus the identity, and then I had the Pauli matrices, and the sigma bar mu was minus the identity and minus the Pauli matrices. So I claim here that I can impose a Majorana condition, and uh, the matrix I need is a, a bit funny looking, it's gamma 2 gamma, and I also have a gamma 5 matrix, which is a product of the other gammas, so I have minus i gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. And now let's see that indeed uh, this really is a consistent uh, matrix to use to impose a Majorana condition. So we need to check uh, that BB star is, is the identity. So let's, let's first look at B times B, and then we'll think a little bit about what, what B star should be. So B times B is gamma 2, gamma, gamma 2, gamma. So gamma uh, anti-commutes through the gamma 2. I can write that as gamma 2, gamma 2, gamma, gamma. Uh, both of those square to 1, and so the result here is minus 1. Now if we look back at how the gamma matrix is defined, we see that uh, gamma 2 is the only pure imaginary uh, gamma matrix. The rest are real which implies in turn that um, B is pure imaginary. And it also implies now that B, B star had better be one uh, if B times B itself is minus one, right? Because if B is pure imaginary, taking the complex conjugate will flip the sign. So that's our boat consistency condition for this B matrix. And then next let's look at the consistency with the Lorentz algebra. So here I need to see how B conjugates with the gamma matrices, B, gamma mu, B inverse. Well, if B squares uh, to minus one, B inverse must be minus B. So I can write this as minus B, gamma mu, B. And then we'll expand that out using the definition. So we have gamma two, gamma, gamma mu, gamma two, gamma. So I know I can commute, or I can anti-commute the gamma five matrix through the other gammas. So I can write this as minus gamma two, gamma, gamma, gamma mu, gamma two, gamma five squares to one. And so this is minus gamma two, gamma mu, gamma two. And now I have to consider each case uh, independently. It gets a little bit messy here. So the claim is that if uh, mu is two, this is minus a gamma two. I guess that's clear, right? Because gamma two squares to one and I'm just left with a minus gamma two. And then if mu is not equal to two, well, I can anti-commute the gamma 2 through the gamma mu. That gives me an extra minus sign, and I can write this as gamma mu. And then since gamma 2 is the only pure imaginary gamma matrix among these, whereas all the other ones are pure real, I can think about this as gamma mu complex conjugate, right? Because that will flip the sign of the gamma 2, but will leave all the other ones unchanged. And this was our other consistency condition, our happy face uh, consistency condition, that it be compatible with the Lorentz algebra. So... We've demonstrated uh, a B matrix through which we can impose a reality condition and shown that we, so, so these uh, spinners in four dimensions can be Majorana. But there's a, there's a critical difference here from the two dimensional case that uh, the gamma five matrix and this B matrix don't commute. So let's just see that. So I, I write this as gamma, gamma two, gamma, minus gamma two, gamma, gamma. 
where this is my B matrix. So I can anti-commute the gamma through the gamma two. I can write this as minus gamma, gamma two, minus gamma two, gamma, gamma. And so this is uh, just minus two, gamma two. It's not zero. So they're not simultaneously diagonalizable, which has the consequence that I, I cannot have file and Meyer on a fermions at the same time. I can make my fermions file, I can make them Majorana, but I can't make them both. So that, that table that we had for the two-dimensional case gets cut short. So I've got my four complex dimensional Dirac representation that I start with. I can decompose it in one direction into two complex uh, dimensional file spinners, or I can decompose it in the other into four real dimensional Majorana, but then I can't further uh, impose uh, both conditions. So I'll leave the general D case to discuss as an exercise for the online lecture, and also for you to, to ponder over a little bit yourself. There's some very interesting deep mathematics here, it has to do with the structure of the octonions and the quaternions and so various number fields, and also has to do with uh, this notion of bot periodicity, which we really won't touch on in this, uh, in this module. We, we're much more physics oriented here uh, than math. Uh, but for those of you who are interested, there is this, uh, there is this uh, other big set of ideas to pursue if, if, you're, if you're motivated. All right, so I'll leave you there. I think that's it for this week. And, and next week, we're still not quite done with our discussion of spinners. I've got to uh, next week introduce the uh, notion of a spinner inner product. And I've also got to introduce these Fiertz identities. Um, before we get to uh, the meat of this, subject and, and discuss the supersymmetry algebra itself. Very good.